sky! It's a bird! Why are you freaking out about a bird? Besides, that's a plane. Oh yeah, I, I do see that. Wait, no. No, no, it is a bird! Three of them, in fact. How did we not see that originally? And how was that one flying? Do you have ants in your pants? Love to dance with those ants? Just make sure you leave at least one magazine distance apart. You gotta leave room for this chill beat, brought to you by today's sponsor, the Cove Commuter 2. Now in concrete. The, the color, not the material. These high-performance split speakers can easily separate for stereo sound anywhere in a room, or can combine for a 360 effect, filling the entire room. But that's not all. These things are built different, yo. All day music on one charge, quick connect, Bluetooth tech, and best of all, water resistant. Ah, but not the floor. I'm gonna need to listen to some music to clean up the mess I just made. Like the mess made after Christmas morning, which this would make a great gift for. Give him the ol', hey, I bought you this way past cool split speaker, now use it to help me clean this mess you made unwrapping it. Fun. And here's a holiday gift for you. But also a coupon code, L68. It's like I already paid for 68% of the speakers just for you. Just head to the link in the description, pick your piece and pigment, and again, coupon code L68. That's right, it's a video about the legendary birds, Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres. But wait, they look different. Oh, those are their Galarian forms. We haven't really had a chance to talk about them before, even though Sword and Shield are already two years old. Since the reveal of the legendary birds' Galarian forms, a question was raised by many people in the fandom. Are these birds the same ones that we first met in the Kanto region, or are they separate creatures? It sounds like a stupid question, but it's not just ignorant, but justifiably so. See, in the games, it's not explicitly stated whether or not legendary Pokémon are individuals or if they are part of a sparse yet collective species, i.e. there's more than one of a kind existing. A legendary Pokémon that comes to mind that kind of exemplifies this conundrum is Entei. It is known that the Entei we first meet in Johto was created by Ho-Oh after resurrecting a Pokémon that had perished when the Brass Tower burned down. However, many of Entei's Pokedex entries mentions an Entei being bored whenever a new volcano appears, or when one erupts, which implies that more than one Entei exists, and possibly even before the burning of the Brass Tower. But if you were to look at the Pokedex entries of the other two legendary beasts, None of them have these same implications in their dex entries. We know in the anime the answer with many legendaries is yes, there are many, the obvious examples being Lugia and Rayquaza. And if you want a more detailed answer to the question, are there multiple legendaries, we have a video dedicated to that that I'll link here and in the description. For today though, when it comes to these birds, are there just one of each? Or are there multiple of them out there? Well, let's see if their origins and real-world inspirations can sort of help us in this regard. Just how dramatic are the differences between their Cantonian and Galarian forms? And since their names conveniently follow the same numerical order as their Pokedex listings, let's start with Numero Articuno. According to Bulbapedia, Articuno may be based on the mythical creatures the Simurgh and the Rock. But the Rock, in all my research, has nothing to do with Articuno aside from just being a really big bird. It's just like Corviknight and Firo and Pidiot and Ho-Oh and the rest of the legendary birds. They're all big too, so why don't their pages all mention the Rock? However, the Simurgh is really interesting. The Simurgh is a creature of Persian mythology. It is said that its natural habitat is a place with plenty of water. One of its most notable features is that the bird is so old that it saw the end of the world three times, and as a result has knowledge of all the ages. Meaning, this thing is super smart, and also super wise. The Simurgh was also known to roost in Gaukarina the Hom Tree of Life. And finally, one of the most famous stories involving the Simurg is how it saved the legendary King Zal as a baby who was abandoned in the mountains by his father for being albino. 
How dare! Both Articuno forms do inhabit areas with plenty of water. The Seafoam Islands in Kanto and the Galar region as a whole, but especially the Crown Tundra, which is primarily based on Scotland. But Galarian Articuno, being attracted to the giant tree on Dynatree Hill, can certainly draw comparisons to Simurg and Gao Carina. It's pretty perfect, honestly. Some of Cantonian Articuno's dex entries mention it appearing before doomed people who are lost on an icy mountain, which certainly echoes that famous story mentioned earlier, but what I found most interesting was that the Simurg, having knowledge of all the ages, doesn't just apply to Galarian Articuno, who is a psychic type, since psychic types are normally associated with intelligence and wisdom, but it also applies to Cantonian Articuno as well. Cantonian Articuno has the potential to learn psychic type attacks too, and not just moves like rest or agility, since those are just Articuno moving fast and the other one is literally just falling asleep. No, I'm referring to the move Reflect, which is described as a wondrous wall of light, and I'm also referring to the move's mirror coat, and especially, extrasensory. Some of you might have seen Mirror Coat coming since Articuno learns it naturally in the Let's Go games, but I bet many of you did not know that it could learn Extrasensory. That's because there's only one way you can get Articuno with Extrasensory, and that's with the Articuno that's found as a shadow Pokémon from the game. Pokemon <laughs> Gale of Darkness. Before we move on to the next part, I do want to point out that while the rock doesn't seem to have any connections to either Articuno, there is another mythical bird I found that seems to connect to Galarian Articuno specifically. It's called the Huma from Iranian Legends, and it is best known for never being seen touching the ground. Some legends even going as far as to say that it doesn't even have legs. This could be compared to Galarian Articuno and how it is always seen using its psychic powers, not its wings, to stay in the air and never touch the ground. I mean, look at that. Clearly this movement isn't possible with just its wings alone. <laughs> What the heck? So that was the design as well as what little lore there is regarding this freezing pheasant. But hold on. There's Galarian Articuno's dex entry from Pokemon Shield that says, Known as Articuno, this Pokemon fires beams that can immobilize opponents as if they had been frozen solid. Known as? As if they had been frozen solid? That's an interesting way of phrasing that, uh, but we'll come back to that later. Because here comes Zapdos. Hmm, I wonder if they are friends or froze. Hopefully Zapdos won't shock the boat. Well, have a nice day, Articuno. Now, I'm sure I don't have to go into much detail about Zapdos' design, right? Its name in Japanese is literally just Thunder, and it's clearly based on a Native American Thunderbird. However, I'll elaborate a bit further just in case. The Thunderbird, as I mentioned, is of Native American origin, and while a number of First Nations all across North America have their legends about Thunderbirds, Zapdos, more specifically, seems to primarily be the Thunderbird as depicted by the Northeastern First Nations, like the Algonquin and the Iroquois. Their depiction of the Thunderbird tells of how it can create thunder just by flapping its wings and lightning by flashing their eyes, which is literally what almost all of Zapdos' Pokedex entries say. Though, Zapdos may also draw inspiration from an African creature uniquely called a Lightning Bird, which is also said to summon thunderbolts and lightning. But this creature is also said to have an insatiable thirst for blood. Plus, a common form that it can take, especially in front of women for some reason, is that of a bird called a Hammercock, which does seem to have the right beak and head shape. Plus, those feathers on the back of its head make it look fast, even though in reality they aren't. Uh, they aren't flightless either, uh, though their tail feathers do puff out like this, which is also similar to Gazapdos. Now, Galarian Zapdos has a completely different body type than Cantonian Zapdos, and thus has different design inspirations. Though, when you take a close look at it, it's pretty clear as to what inspired this design. Flightless birds, called chocobo. I mean, ratites, ratites, ratites. Ratitties are a group of birds, some of which you may recognize, such as the ostrich, emu, and even kiwis. Galarian Zapdos seems to take inspiration from a combination of some of these animals. The most notable ones that stick out are ostriches and rayas. Both are known for their powerful kicks. However, the ostrich is also known for setting the fastest land speed record of any bird, and the raya is best known for being able to jump really high and being very aggressive. And 
and all of these traits are seen with Galarian Zapdos. But as far as lore, we're batting 0 for 2 here, except Galarian Zapdos's sword dex entry states, when its feathers rub together, they produce a crackling sound, like the zapping of electricity. That's why this Pokémon is called Zapdos. Th th there it is again! The way it's phrased! How weird! It can't just be a coincidence, can it? Uh, perhaps we'll find the answer when we cover the last bird, which conveniently is coming in hot over the horizon now. I hope Zapdos doesn't blow a fuse with this hothead's arrival. Well, go on then. Use your fight or flight list instinct. Yeah, yeah, go. You should leave. It'll be here evil eventually. Man, what a dark difference between this bird and the last one. Moltres is the flame Pokémon, huh, just like a few other Pokémon. And in Japanese, its name is Fire. See what I mean when I mentioned the straightforwardness of these Pokémon? Thunder? Fire? Articuno is Freezer. Anyways, Moltres, just like with Articuno, has deep design inspirations, though Moltres does have Articuno beat in sheer number of inspirations. Those inspirations are the Phoenix, obviously, Bennu, an Egyptian god of rebirth, Chu Che, the vermilion bird of the south, the Huma, again, and the Firebird of Slavic folklore. For the sake of brevity, I'll just explain that the Phoenix, Bennu, and Huma all have one thing in common, and that's rebirth. The physical kind, specifically. The Huma and Phoenix both are consumed wholly in flames before rising from their ashes. And while it's not explicitly known if the god Bennu also bursts into flames, it is said that it would renew itself as the sun would do. But moving from physical rebirth to metaphorical rebirth, we have all these Pokedex entries associating Moltres with the spring season. However, only one Dex entry specifies in which direction Moltres comes from when spring arrives. The south. Why does this one very specific detail matter? Well, that's where Chuche comes in. Chuche is one of the four symbols of the Chinese constellations, four guardians of the four cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. According to the Taoist Five Elemental System, Chuche represents the element of fire, the direction south, and the summer season. Now, I know that last part doesn't exactly line up with Moltres, especially since east is the direction that is associated with the spring, but if you think about it, where is Moltres typically found? Victory Road, Mount Silver, and Mount Ember. The first two are east of Johto, and the last is southeast of Johto. <laughs> no? Not, not buying that stretch? Okay, well, I tried. Not every detail has to be one-to-one, -one, you know. Well, finally, that leaves us with the last creature, and the one that connects both Cantonian and Galarian Moltres, the Slavic Firebird. This creature is a large, magical bird that either glows in a fiery red, orange, and yellow light, or is just straight up on fire, depending on who's telling the story. This bird is said to be both a blessing as well as a harbinger of doom. You can certainly see how this would tie back to both of our fiery feathered... I was going to say friends, but uh, one of them is literally classified as the malevolent Pokémon. Uh, anyways, both Pokémon fit this dichotomy very well. We know that Cantonian Moltres is seen in a more warm light, and not just in a few of its dex entries, but also from a... well, not a first-person account per se. Uh, but one of the Cinnabar Island gym trainers does say that Blaine was once lost in the mountains, but the light emitted from Moltres allowed him to travel back to safety, and this later inspired him to become a fire-type trainer. Certainly, Blaine would see that situation as a blessing, but what about the Harbinger of Doom part? Well, that would be Galarian Moltres. As I mentioned before, it's literally called the Malevolent Pokémon. But not only that, both of its dex entries describe it as Sinister, and it's Dark-type now. Wait a minute. The sinister aura that blazes like molten fire around this Pokémon is what inspired the name Moltres. Take that! Triple finish! Known as Articuno, that is why this Pokémon is called Zapdos, inspired the name Moltres. Have you noticed how all of these dex entries seem to imply that these particular Pokémon aren't actually the same Pokémon from the Kanto region that were introduced all those years ago? Certainly, these are separate creatures who were arbitrarily given these specific names, based on, well, 
be honest, flawed observations. Like, okay, I'll give the Galarian Zapdos one a bit of credit since it does describe it doing a similar thing as Cantonian Zapdos with its wings and all. You could even reasonably argue that due to Galarian Zapdos having a drastically smaller wingspan and size compared to its Cantonian counterpart, it physically can't produce lightning bolts and instead can only produce enough electricity to produce crackling sounds. Maybe it's just static electricity. I don't know. Well, how about the other two? Galarian Articuno immobilizes opponents as if they were frozen. It is not the same thing. Making others stop in their tracks by breaking their minds with psychic attacks isn't the same thing as literally freezing someone with ice. Galarian Moltres, this Pokémon's sinister flame-like aura, and the sinister aura that blazes like molten fire, again, it's not the same thing as Cantonian Moltres, who is on fire! Even Peony comments on this, calling Galarian Moltres lukewarm, which is saying something. Since he's a Steel-type Pokémon trainer, he should be extra sensitive to that. Also, the part in the Sword Dex entry about victims become burnt out shadows of themselves? It's clearly metaphorical. I'm certain Galarian Moltres is using its dark powers to consume souls, as it says in the first half of that same Dex entry. But it's also clearly evoking the phrases burnt out and shadow of your former self. Like if you ever had a serious case of burnout or been in a deep, dark depression, then you know exactly what that looks and feels like being burnt out, like all your fuel is gone. Out with the flames. But also, as a side note, what is it with Articuno and Moltres being the only ones to get these regional forms that explicitly contrast with them? Articuno and Moltres Pokedex entries mention how they appear before people who get lost in the mountains and presumably guide them to safety. And yet, I get the feeling that their Galarian farms would just leave you to die with Galarian Articuno preferring to just float there and slowly watch you freeze to death intently. And Galarian Moltres literally would just see this as an opportunity. It's gonna swallow your soul and leave you an empty husk. Hmm, good for any passing Mandibuzz and Volby to pick apart. Lovely. But then Zapdos! Yeah, It's got strong leggies now. Okay. Okay, well, let's circle back to our initial question. Are the Galarian legendary birds the same birds that we first meet in the Kanto region, or are they separate creatures? Going off what little lore there is, I think they are not the same. Especially when the reasons given have some... holes. Oh, but their shiny forms give them the same colors as the Cantonian birds. Surely that means they're the same, right? Unfortunately, the jury is still out on whether all shiny legendaries are even canon or not. Uh, but now I turn it to you. What do you guys think? Are these the same birds after some metamorphosis triggered by them eating the fruit of the Dynamax tree? Or are they different birds altogether? Perhaps there truly are many of these birds, after all, all around the Pokémon world. Otherwise, how would each of the player protagonist characters all catch them, you know? But anyway, which forms do you like more? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to never stop using your noggin!